epistle for this uh, Feast of the Epiphany is from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Arise, be enlightened, O Jerusalem, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. For behold, darkness covers the earth and amidst the people, but the Lord rises as light upon thee, and his glory is seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall walk in thy light, and the kings in the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thy eyes round about and see. All these are gathered together, they have come to thee. Thy sons shall come from afar, and thy daughters shall rise up at thy side. Then shalt thou see and and abound, and thy heart shall wander and be enlarged. When the riches from the sea shall be turned to thee, possessions of the Gentiles shall come to thee. A multitude of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Madian and Ephah. All they from Saba shall come, bringing gold and frankincense, and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. And when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah in the days of King Herod, behold, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born King of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled, and so was all Jerusalem with him. And gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, He inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judah, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem of the land of Judah, art by no means least among the princes of Judah, for from thee shall come forth a leader who shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the Magi secretly and carefully ascertained from them the time when the star had appeared to them. And sending them to Bethlehem, he said, Go and make careful inquiry concerning the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, that I too may go and worship him. Now they, having heard the king, went their way. And behold, the star that they had seen in the east went before them, until it came and stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly. And entering the house, they found the child with Mary his mother. And falling down, they worshipped him. Opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back to their own country by another way. So the words of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. <coughs> the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My brothers and sisters, uh, there not being a specific uh, assigned intention uh, for this Mass, I will do as I usually do and make it for the intention of the preservation of all the traditional rites. Epiphany literally means a theophany, that is, a sharing or manifestation of God. Originally, uh, for Christians, it was a feast that centered on the Christmas events. So we know the, the, uh, the angels and the... the um, Um, shepherds and uh, the virgin birth and all this Um, and it was separated out after some time from the uh, relatively private events of Christmas to include the three great public manifestations of Christ first is the Christmas star itself which brought the Magi first Gentiles, the baptism of the Lord where the uh, Blessed Trinity shows up and proclaims uh, Jesus, Son of God, 
and the wedding at Cana, where water is changed into wine. And it was placed, the feast was placed on January 6th to counter, the church often did this, there was a sun god who was worshipped in Egypt. Now Egypt at that time was not full of Muslims, this is way before the Muslims. They had a lot of Christians in northern Africa, and uh, so, but it also had a lot of pagans too. The old uh, religion did not die easily there. And so, uh, as the church often did, they placed this particular feast directly contrary in, on the same date to uh, basically uh, take away from this rising sun nonsense. So uh, that's why it was put there. Now the Magi were learned men from the East. They were astrologers, which means they had some very wrong um, uh, faulty assumptions, uh, such as thinking that the stars determined people's lives and things like that. Uh, but they were eager to know the truth. And so in prophecy, uh, they knew that Jerusalem or Zion, well, they didn't know this, but they knew the prophecies and they knew uh, that the star was had something uh, very extra to add to everything. And the prophecies, um, uh, Jerusalem and Zion were prototypes, we know, of the church, which the Gentiles as well as the Jews would stream. Talks about, in Isaiah, talks about the sons and daughters who will be streaming to you and will be at your right hand. And the fulfillment of the prophecies began with the coming of the Magi, the first Christian converts of the Gentiles, as they've been called. God gave gifts of inner enlightenment, apparently, to the Magi at the star's appearance. Now, by contrast, the priests and scribes of Herod's court were well-educated also. All of the prophecies and all the things that were supposed to happen regarding the coming of the Messiah. Presumably, they also saw this star, and yet they made no use of the knowledge that they had. So the question arises that if the Magi were given a very large gift of faith, why did they insist on coming and seeing the child? Why didn't they simply take God or the prophecy's words uh, that it, it was true? Now, Pope Leo XIII said, uh, well, they didn't have to see the Christ child, but they were impelled to for our sake. The Spirit inspired them to come and see the child so that it could be reported uh, about them to us. And uh, that's a, a certainly an inviting explanation. I think also it's true that inspired they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to complete their knowledge and understanding and welcome him in a human way. Human means that right from the get-go, it's both spiritual and bodily, working together, the spirit working through the body. And since uh, this is in Christ's incarnation we're talking about, uh, it's very fitting you could say, as St. Thomas might say, uh, it's very fitting that they would come and welcome him uh, as, as the human beings that they are or were. So um, uh, the re there's a reality that is beneath what we see physically. It's an invisible spiritual reality, that being God the Son himself, the response should be in like kind. Now that's the Mori theory, M48, uh, subtitle C, and you can certainly disagree with it. Uh, and of, uh, so say in a similar way, Mary didn't ask for the sign, uh, you know, proof of what the angel Gabriel was telling her. 
say, well, how about Elizabeth, you know, or somebody else I know, uh, have you done something miraculous for them? She was given that sign and was given to help her to, again, exercise charity in a human way to make the effort to go to Elizabeth and to have that great exchange of love that they show and a confidence in God. So um, the, the epiphany shows us the greatest gift, which is God among us, and our response should be in like kind. God assumes human nature, man returns human acknowledgement of the gift and the praise. Adam Benedict Bauer, writing in the early 50s um, in Germany, uh, he comes up with a, an interesting image. It says, Epiphany is the betrothal between Christ and his church. And we often talk about the marriage between Christ and his church. Christ is a bridegroom and the the uh, church is the bride, and uh, this is the betrothal. This is the showing forth uh, and making it clear that Christ, that God the Son, is among us and within us, within our race. And uh, some of you may have been at the recent betrothal we had here, and uh, and uh, you know it's like just like that. It's a promise on both sides, a promise to, uh, uh, that uh, the Lord is making to be among us in some way or another uh, forever. And it's a promise made by the Magi on behalf of the, the uh, Gentiles to respond to it, to acknowledge him. So uh, there are, uh, let's see. Yeah. Earthly betrothal can at best achieve only a union of effort, a union of wills, a union of love, and a union of purpose. <coughs> In this betrothal, the church and we ourselves are caught up into what Bauer calls a vital and mystical union with Christ. Earthly betrothal and marriage are mere imitations of the union of Christ with the church. Bauer says, quote, the church is the ever-present epiphany, the abiding presence of Christ on earth, unquote. In the works of the church, we recognize the priesthood of Christ, truth and grace of Christ, the power and authority of Christ. And this does not mean the leaders of the moment are going to faithfully reflect that in any particular time. With the church's constant and universal teaching and guidance, the uh, drift of our history, despite all the fruits and nuts and other people that we've had among our leaders over the centuries and among the laity over the centuries, and yet uh, the church goes on. It's more than a mediator. It is Christ on earth. The church, therefore, is a mystical body of Christ whose soul of that body is the Holy Spirit. And we can compare this uh, with the union of the vine and it, with its branches. Jesus himself made this comparison in the Gospel of John. The vine lives in its branches, which share in the life of the vine. So it becomes a union where there is one. Uh, there's a betrothal and a marriage with God, and, which basically involves a mutual exchange of love, of covenant love. The betrothal, as I said, is a promise to complete the marriage, finish the marriage uh, later on, to complete the ceremony, to consummate the marriage, and, and go on with it. It's a promise that is not uh, 
uh, for people at least, is a promise that's not legally enforceable, and yet it can, it can be used uh, that way. Response to the God's man, um, let me see. This mutual exchange of love we see uh, particularly in the sacrifice of the mass, which I'll mention in a moment. Response to the God's man, God man's presence among us does not end with the Magi. We all, even to this day, have both the privilege and the duty to be in our lives little epiphanies, to be little manifestations of God, of the presence of the King of Love, following always a star of faith that's given to us as it was to the Magi to draw them to Christ. Our gifts to him should be the gold of faith and devotion, incense of veneration and adoration, and the myrrh of the willingness to accept all hardships, sacrifices, and humiliations for his sake. Christ's sonship is his by nature. He communicates sonship to the faithful by grace. No more so does he do this than at the holy sacrifice of the Mass. This is, not to be off color, the marital act of the son with his church, the groom with his bride. This is what should be an exchange of total love. Certainly it is on the part of the son and it should be on our part to love the Lord, particularly during Mass, as much as we possibly can and to offer him sincerely uh, custody of our lives. So uh, this is where we should offer the sacrifice of ourselves to God, even as a priest on our behalf, offer, offers the sacrifice of the Son once again to his Father. May God bless you. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Well, announcement-wise, I probably need to do another um, <laughs> blessing over the, over the group because our uh, friend Andrew Moore uh, had an accident today on his way here. Everybody's okay. It wasn't his fault, which is uh, good, and uh, the other person's okay, too, uh, but they've, uh, they've had a real time. They sent us pictures of the car. Uh, which doesn't really look like much of a car right now. <laughs> so uh, so uh, I'm sure he'll, they'll be back tomorrow. And uh, tomorrow is uh, the Feast of the Holy Family uh, for us. And uh, so uh, that should be, God willing, and the creek don't rise, that should be a, a Misa Cantata. <laughs>